Hello and welcome to another episode of 10x Marketer podcast. Today we have Valentin Radu with us. He is the founder and CEO of Omni Convert. He is a well-known speaker on the topics of customer value optimization and we have invited him to talk about that only. Are you tired of putting money into acquiring customers and not getting the kind of return that you are expecting? Is there a secret to converting your first time buyer into a loyal customer? What are the strategies that you can use to maximize your customer lifetime value? These and some more topics related to customer value optimization is what we are going to discuss today. Before we jump into the episode, can I request you to subscribe and follow our channel wherever you are listening it from. We are available on Spotify, YouTube and Apple podcast and lot many other podcast channels. So subscribe to us and then let's get started. Hey there and uh, thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm uh, obsessed with the customer lifetime value and conversion rate. I've uh, founded four companies so far and uh, the latest one is going uh, stronger than ever. It's called OmniConvert and we are helping uh, companies improve their conversion rate and their customer lifetime value. Uh, in order to do so, I'm also uh, trying to educate the market about the importance of customer lifetime value. And that's why I wrote a book called The CLV Revolution. And uh, I'm also, I've also founded the, the CVO Academy, which is uh, an online training uh, program for companies willing to improve their customer lifetime value. It's so great to have you here, Valentin. And uh, let's start with your earlier journey when you started your career at selling cookbooks on the street to finally founding four companies and going strong with OmniConvert. How has your experience really helped you understand the concept of customer lifetime value and how do you see it uh, shaping your thoughts right now? Yeah, so uh, I had no money to, to give you the full context back in uh, when I was 17. It was 1997 and uh, I was trying to uh, take my girlfriend on the seaside. So I had no money, so I had to do something. And I found a temp job where I was uh, paid on commission. So if I managed to, saw, to sell uh, cookbooks, I got paid. So initially I... I got a bag of uh, full of books and I was uh, on the streets, you know, uh, chasing for, for customers. And I, I, I thought everyone could buy a cookbook, at least in my, I don't know, teenager uh, brain. But what I've understood is that uh, mainly the women, the ladies, which were a bit elder, <coughs> were the ones that uh, were, uh, let's say, paying any kind of attention to me. And then I've started to understand what's the notion of ideal customer profile, you know, by actually doing this. So I've switched to a certain target. And then I understood that there is also the location was important. And I understood that, for instance, they couldn't run away from me while they were waiting for the bus to come. If they had kids and if they were uh, grandmothers, that was, that was even better because they, weren't, they had nowhere to, to, to go. And then I changed my, uh, let's say, my pitch, you know, my intro to them. I started to tell them, instead of uh, saying to them, hey, I have some cookbooks, so no, do you want to buy them? I've started by asking them about their own, uh, let's say, agendas. Like, don't you want your nephews to think that you're the greatest uh, grandmother on the planet? And, you know, I was start starting to play with, uh, with this. And I analyzed actually my conversion rate and my conversion rate uh, got 10 times higher when I changed the target, the location and the pitch, you know, the offer, you know, how, how, how am I packaging this? And I, I realized back then that, Oh man, so I can change the behavior of the customers. And anyways, I got to the seaside and I understood a lot about this type of uh, how to sell, how to position, how to persuade other people. And uh, basically that was uh, instrumental to everything I, uh, I did afterwards. That's awesome. So I think that's the very good start and... Uh building up your fundamentals by learning from experience uh, it's really valuable uh, valentin now you have been talking about uh, the customer lifetime value optimization from the beginning even when we discussed about the topic that was one thing that you came up uh, passionately about now according to you uh, why is it so crucial for businesses today to improve their customer lifetime value 
Yeah. So, so to give you my, my transition from conversion rate to customer lifetime value, I think it's important, Giri, to, to understand that uh, after doing this, after founding companies, I realized that it's about having traffic and converting that traffic into customers. But there are certain business models where you need repeat customers. So maybe you are not able to break even, you know, to... to to, to, to get back your customer acquisition cost money from the very beginning, from the first order. So what do you do after that? So you are counting on customers to come back and buy again because you pay the customer acquisition cost once, but the customer lifetime value should be higher than the customer acquisition cost, right? But that customer lifetime value is basically the profit that you are making down the line from each and every customer. Which means that if you have customers buying three times or four times, you pay the customer acquisition cost only once. And if you get them into the habit of buying over and over again, then you will be profitable. So I understood this type of mechanics with my third company, which was a car insurance company. And to be honest, after my learnings about converting traffic, I've understood, okay, I'm converting traffic. I'm making way more, we are making way more orders, but the Google AdWords cost was so high that we couldn't break even. And it was frustrating for me. I mean, basically, my wife was the breadwinner back, back then. And frustration led to investigating what can I do to be profitable with this company? We were, we were selling millions. You know, I, we, we had at that, that point something like $5 million in uh, annual turnover. But I was bringing home less money than my wife. And that led to so much frustration that I started to investigate what's going on. So that was the moment when I understood the uh, concept of customer lifetime value. And I think long term is the, is the game every company should be playing. Of course, if it uh, affords to play this uh, long term game. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I understood that you have to have customers which are so, uh, let's say, pleased about their experience that they want to repeat that experience to buy again. And in the car insurance uh, uh, business model, it's all about customer retention, right? So we, we started with the 58% customer retention. We ended up with 82% customer retention. And we understood back then by talking with the customers by doing a lot of things that I'm uh, open to, to, to discuss about. So it, it, I understood the process of understanding customer behavior, of improving customer experience, and of finding out the products and the services that they were after. And basically, any company out there, if, if you don't care about customer lifetime value and you are selling any kind of products or services which are about repeat business, then you are underspending or overspending. So you can do one of those two things if you don't know the exact ratio between customer lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. And in an environment which is so competitive, it's a pity. So you, you can be out of business without even knowing. True. And uh, 58 to 82% is really a huge jump. I think uh, there are more companies out there who are struggling to uh, in control the customer acquisition cost. And what I'm hearing from you is uh, that's not really something which you should be really worried about. Rather, you should be worried about the balance between uh, the customer lifetime value and the customer acquisition cost. So there's no right or wrong customer acquisition cost. But the focus should be on how can the CLV be higher than the uh, acquisition so that ultimately you turn profitable. And yeah. then let's say I understand it theoretically, but when you come up with something practical on how uh, CAC versus CLV, uh, what is the right way to find their balance? Or is there any example where you can help me understand it even deeper for my audience? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 of course. So the, the golden ratio, let's say, the, the average benchmark is uh, saying, stating that you need to be uh, generating three, time, or three times higher customer lifetime value than the customer acquisition cost. So basically, if your customer acquisition cost is $10, your CLV should be $30. Now, I'm in favor with, some, with this type of uh, thinking, 
However, what you need to take into account is where is your company? Because if you are trying to acquire market share and you have the funding to justify a lower uh, ratio between CLV to customer acquisition cost, you can go as down as two or one. Like we have, I don't know how uh, impactful is in Europe, but we, we are seeing in the US, we have uh, Temu, we have uh, Shine, we have this type of uh, uh, companies which are burning money into customer acquisition in order to acquire a, a huge customer base so that because they maybe know or they calculated the predictive customer lifetime value and they know that if you get customers into the buying habit, you will break even sometimes in the future. Now, when you have a smaller company and you have that, uh, you don't have that huge funding, then you need to break even. Then you need to have a, a higher CLV to CAC ratio. So it all boils down to how much can you afford to pay to acquire a customer? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and also, how much time do you afford to wait? Because there are two components. Are you breaking even? And when are you breaking even? Like if the uh, what is called the customer acquisition cost payback period. Like I'm paying right now $10 to acquire a customer and I'm going to get $30. But if I'm going to get those $30 in three years, do I have the financials to wait for this period to, to, to come? So that's how it, uh, how it works. You need to take into account these two components and also the time uh, the time component, which also ha uh, comes with the inflation problem, you know, the, the cost of capital. Because it's one thing to pay now $10 and it's another thing to get $10 in two years, right? Yeah, so you brought in some very, very important fundamental aspects into the conversation. So one is uh, you have to have a clear understanding of your operational cost, right? So, yes. uh, so one is like, 3x or 2x or 4x is uh, theoretically it looks good like if you have 3x of your uh, CAC then you are in a good shape but maybe operationally 3x is also not viable then there might be some lean companies uh, specifically when uh, we have a lot of more AI tools coming and people are using less of human resource so human resource cost might come down in future. So operationally, it might be viable for you to even survive at 2x of your CAC. Then there might be companies who are not even able to survive at 5x. So that, that's a balance which the companies have to find. Now, according to you, what are the common mistakes people make when they are using this uh, these two metrics or the this balancing approach and yeah. how those uh, mistakes can be avoided? Yeah, so the first mistake, Giri, is that they don't understand the, the right formula. So the customer lifetime value co uh, <coughs> formula should take into account the gross margin, should uh, not only the revenue, right? So many companies are making this mistake like relying on the revenue instead of relying on the gross margin. There are other, let's say, <coughs> more sophisticated companies which are trying to get the net margin. So to calculate the net profit that they are generating from each and every customer, which is a serious undertaking and uh, it requires a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, financial uh, modeling to, to get there. So uh, another, uh, another thing is to, to take into account the cost of capital. So if you are selling fast moving consumer goods, that's okay. Because I don't know, if you are selling, let's say food, groceries, I don't know, things that <coughs> have a high purchase frequency on the uh, or on a time interval, that's great. But if you are selling, I don't know, furniture or long-term uh, uh, goods, you know, like uh, slow-moving uh, consumer goods, then that means you need to take into account the cost of capital as well. And uh, uh, another thing which I, I found it uh, outrageous is that many companies stop at analyzing the customer lifetime value. So they don't do experiments. They don't run optimization processes. Then they don't do changes, you know? Like they take customer lifetime value as gravity. That's it. It's uh, like this. But no, this can be affected. So you need to have uh, a way to look at the lead indicators which are uh, improving the customer lifetime value. So you don't have to stop at measuring customer lifetime value and customer acquisition cost, you need to start to measure 
how many actions have I done this quarter to improve customer lifetime value? How many changes have I made? Because it's like in our lives as well, right? So we let, let's pretend that we have a shitty job. We are not pleased about it. But at how many interviews have you got? You know, like how many jobs have you looked for? Because if you don't change your ways, you can't change your destiny. And that's right for individuals and it's right for companies as well. That's so true. And I think one of the important fallacy here, which often seen in companies is that uh, when they, in theory, they convert a CAC into a CLV, like it's 3x, but there might be huge number of customer who drop after the first transaction because they really don't felt that kind of caring or that kind of uh, att- attention which they were seeking or which they were looking for. They were not really attended to. And you also talked about when we were discussing, uh, you also shared this point earlier that many companies think that they care about the customer, but in reality, they don't. So that's a huge statement. And I would like to understand this in more detail. What is really uh, like when you want to have an increased CLV, you, of course, need to take care of your customer. And what are the important metrics or let's not call them metrics? What are the important indicators which uh, clearly help you understand that these companies are pretending to be taking care of their customers, but in reality, uh, that might not be true. Yeah. So um, in order to answer this question, Giri, I think it's very important for uh, for our listeners to, to understand that there are ways to understand how pleased, how satisfied your customers are. And on the other hand, we have... Uh, all sorts of uh, companies, like we have our financial targets and whatever. So most of the time we are disconnected from what the customers really want. Now we have product centric companies, which they acquire goods, they produce them and they sell them. And we have customer centric companies where customer feedback and ending the loop of customer feedback, it's a major priority for these companies. And if we understand that we have conflicting interests, like, okay, if you want to make short-term profit happen, you increase the price, you do some offers, but will those customers be happy about it? You don't know. But if you want to play the long-term game, then what you have to do is to understand what are my customers after? So what they do want how pleased they are about these three components. And basically in my methodology around improving the customer lifetime value, we have three pillars. What you sell, which is very important, of course, the products or services that you're selling. What you do, which is the customer experience that you offer in order to, I don't know, sell those products, use those products, know how to get value from those products. And the third thing is what you say which is marketing, how you are, what you are promising. Because when you are selling a first time product to your customers, you are selling a promise of a better future. And if you don't know if you fulfilled that promise to your customers, so if you don't close the loop of customer feedback, then you don't know if your customers are pleased uh, about what you're selling or not. And basically, that's uh, why metrics such as net promoter score or customer effort score, these are important to get the pulse of this, right? And that's basically we, when we understood that, we ended up building an entire technology, an entire product around this because we understood how ma- massively important it is to get the customer feedback. Now, most companies and most uh, marketeers, they look at things like uh, CTR, CPC, you know, how much traffic, what's the bounce rate, stuff like that. And that's great. That's important. This is the visitor behavior. But you also need to take into account the customer behavior, which means you need to, to look at the post-purchase behavior. And mainly that's why I think companies which they truly care about their customers and how they are fulfilling the promise they use their ears more than their mouths. You know, you know, it was that saying that you need to listen twice than uh, you talk because that's why, uh, I don't know, you have two ears and only one mouth. That's so true. And so, see, to understand the post-purchase behavior and understand how the customer is 
interacting or reacting to whatever you are doing like increasing price decreasing the price offering discounts trying to increase loyalty including some promotions specifically to your customers uh for all that and to understand how the customer is reacting you need certain data according to you what are the data points or what are the some important metrics or the data that you can look at and understand that yes my customer is happy you talked about nps you talked about customer effort score so these are some of the important metrics apart from that how do you really understand uh, and specifically uh, in the context of online businesses when you are not so when you are not interacting with your customer on on the face to face basis your customer might be in a different geography in a different culture yeah. how what are the important data points or what are the dashboards that a ceo should have in order to understand that yes my customer is happy my customer lifetime value would keep increasing further yeah so of course besides the usual suspects like the clv nps customer acquisition cost you need to break those down into segments of customers and that's why for instance i'm a really good uh, big fan of uh, uh, rfm recency frequency and monetary value because not all your customers are the right customers so you need to look at how your customer segments are doing you know the loyal customers the vip customers the so and so customers the uh, low value and lost customers so basically you need to to get deeper into the quantitative data so that you look at this CLV NPS customer acquisition cost by RFM segment by geography by pro- the first product or pro- first category that they've bought because if you look at this in a granular way then you can uh, find out some anomalies and those anomalies are the most lucrative things that you can do and let me give you an example rather than just talking theoretically Well, one of our first customers uh, were they were selling uh, shoes yeah one of the biggest players here in central and eastern europe and uh, they they thought that they have a problem with the competition they wanted to throw money into a tv campaign whatever so what we discovered with their uh, chief marketing officer was like yeah the competition is on our back we need to invest 2 million dollars uh, into this tv campaign and i was asking them but why are our, your customers migrating how the behavior of your loyal customers is doing he raised his shoulders and said let's find out so we've made the rfm segmentation and we understood that the their problem was not about their competition in the first place their problem was that they started to add new products new brands into their offering and their loyal customers bought this new brand and then they never come back and then they realized that this product was a low uh, low quality uh, brand the numbers showed that hey people are buying it but hey people are not returning after they buy this so that was their uh, their issue so they fixed the problem not with throwing and that's why the i mean uh, as you can see there is not like a silver bullet you throw money on uh, traffic and uh, marketing campaigns and uh, you will end up uh, being successful it's about doing this type of investigations you know to understand the ca- customer behavior and if you if you use rfm segmentation and look at these anomalies if you look at the nps if you get the qualitative feedback from your customers and understand why they are pissed off then you will be in a position to change things if you if all th- that you are doing is like i've said with that guy which was frustrated about their job if all that you are doing is look at the numbers and uh, uh, not changing the way you are uh, let's say affecting those numbers then you will have the same uh, uh, the same results awesome so i think this is a very good example i think uh, one more example you can share and that should come from your experience working uh, on scaling the insurance business because insurance business is fundamentally different from any grocery or uh, like day to day buying business where you have to buying frequency is very high uh, the car insurance would expire in one year customer will come later only uh, then but there are multiple insurance product that you can sell to one customer 
where upselling and cross selling becomes very important to increase the CLV. Maybe initially when your customer came into your store or came onto your website, they were not looking to buy multiple products from you. They were just looking to buy one product. So in terms of insurance, uh, I think we can connect this example to everything else, including the software products, the subscription businesses. How does uh, CLV play a role into businesses like this? And what was your experience? How did you really uh, increase the CLV or uh, maybe worked on decreasing the CAC <laughs> in the yeah. context of online insurance selling sure so one thing that we did back then was to uh, to to fix the customer experience so we wanted to make sure that the customers were getting uh, were being treated the best and uh, we've made this survey happen and we uh, added a target for the nps so we've said that our company should have an nps of 85 so we increased the N nps from 50 something to 85. And how we did that was by being very responsive to the customers, building an onboarding uh, uh, sequence. So making sure that what they are buying, they are getting in no time, right? So improving the customer experience behind, besides the insurance, because at least in the car insurance, most of the time you, you buy the peace of mind for uh, about a bad future. So, how you pack the, the, the service, you, you don't see it, you know? I mean, the insurance is like a freaking piece of paper that you have there and you can go on the street with your car. So we understood that and we, we made it very, we, we made our customer experience amazing. Then we applied our segmentation and we understood which are the customer groups which are the best. In our case, were the luxury car owners and the truck drivers because the insurance was way more expensive for those kind of groups. So we started, instead of just improving the, the CLV for these type of customers, we, for all our customers, we've started to make acquisition campaigns for certain uh, groups of uh, customers. So we've got into where they were spending their time. You know, the truck drivers were using these types of uh, uh, forums, and we've started to advertise there. We've made some deals with their the the these uh, communities to give them a better, a slightly better price. And we ended up improving the, the the lifetime value by acquiring more valuable customers, right? And um, another thing that we uh, we did back then was to make sure that they are getting uh, uh, the the reactivation flow, you know, the renewal flow to be in place uh, uh, at, at, uh, based on their alerts, right? So we, right after they've bought the insurance, we prompted them into uh, getting an SMS, getting an email, or getting even a phone call to remind them that their in the insurance is expiring. So this, these simple, three simple things that we did were the ones that improved our uh, our customer lifetime value back, back then. And it's an important aspect here I think there is a quote from uh, Desmond Tutu. We need to stop saving people from drowning. We need to go upstream to see why they fall in the water in the first place. So knowing what types of customers you need to acquire and why they are churning is very important because that means you, need to, you will be able to fix the acquisition from the upstream, right? You, need to, you will have the right promises so that customers... You place the seed of the renewal in their heads from the very beginning. You acquire the right customers from the very beginning, which means it's way more uh, effective than doing what you always did, which is, I don't know, throwing money on ads to Meta, Google, and so on. Yeah, so you brought in an excellent point. And I think this is one of the fundamentals uh, that CLV increase or not. Companies are often uh, offering huge discounts to acquire customers. When you offer huge discounts, you attract people who are looking for discounts. They are value seekers and they are always looking for discounts. So the behavior of those kind of specific group of customer is that Wherever there's a huge discount, maybe they will switch to that insurance provider in future because that um, that determine their behavior. They are looking for discount. 
they are on the way looking for discount all the time that's one problem with uh, increasing offering a higher discount and then expecting the clv to increase because on uh, that impacts the customer behavior now there is other aspect to this so so far we talked about uh, a framework which may be applicable to a business that is easily able to survive let's say 3 years without infusing an additional capital or maybe they have a source of capital but uh, if you look at the number of businesses out there in the market 80% of the business are kind of surviving on day to day basis they don't have a capital they don't have a large chunk of money sitting on the table to survive for uh, operationally for such a long period and they acquire customer on the loss expecting it to uh, convert let's say profitable in a year or so so somewhere they have to find the balance between short term goal and the long term goal in order to survive as a business so that your customer can also stay with you because only if you survive as a business your customer will be with you right so how do you find that balance between your short term goal and the long term goal when it comes to let's say clv and cac because uh, your survival as a business is the most important thing for your business yeah so the right answer uh, here is ex- through experimentation so we we can't afford not to experiment and that means you need to look at uh, experimentation as being a part of your uh, uh, daily operations right so if you have enough traffic let's say for a website uh, for an online business if you have the right the enough traffic to uh, to experiment you have to experiment uh, anything you can as fast as you can which means like keeping you the same offer the same positioning and just doing you, what you always did is not going to cut it make the cut So what does it mean? Uh, I'm a big fan of A/B testing of course, like like I've said since I've uh, sold the cookbooks on the street, you know, I was changing the offer, the positioning and whatever. And that's why we we, we ended up building a company that helps other companies to run experiments. So when you run an experiment, which means that if you do a let's say your competition is on your back and you ha- you need to decrease prices but how much should you be decreasing those prices to still be profitable and if you you, you can run experiments to see that you know like you can decrease it gradually and to say to see where the revenue per visitor is going to be if you decrease by that by that by the app and by looking at the gross margin as well and looking at the behavior and this uh, works specifically well for companies which are into the uh, fast moving consumer goods like when you purchase cycle is every 2 weeks 1 month 2 months then you can afford to do this type of uh, uh, experiments right so so to see what kind of messaging works better but one thing that i want our audience to 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 remember is that you can change the behavior without affecting your margin so it's uh, uh, what are the chances that you've uh, came up with the best unique value proposition with the best user interface with the best follow up sequence with the best onboarding so chances are pretty low right so why should you be ruining your margin when you can tweak these aspects first right so to to experiment to run this type of uh, different changes and to see how wh- what it works and uh, uh, of course this requires a change of your behavior but you can't change the cu- your customer's behavior if you don't change your behavior as an owner as an entrepreneur so the m- the major breakthroughs that i had in my life were when i got out there and talked with our customers when i investigated what they were after when i changed the way i verbalized about their uh, uh, about our services and products because at the end of the day you don't need to uh, over complicate things your audience have a low uh, let's say attention span and they invest a very low uh, mental uh, energy to find out what what you are selling to them so if you keep it stupid and simple with using their own words you will end up having better uh, better results and of course there are technologies that can help you to to, to do so awesome and uh, this is a, a very good answer i think uh, this makes more sense to me now uh, 
Now, the other important aspect uh, of increasing the CLV is one is, of course, you talked about the customer segmentation or the data. Other is the post-purchase communication. And I think more companies fail at the post-purchase communication when it comes to CLV because uh, there's no defined framework. Uh, most marketers and most importantly, this is driven by marketers. The post-purchase communication is driven by marketers. And one of the biggest mistakes that they do is they want uh, to convert that second purchase quickly. So they, they end up offering a discount. Yeah. Uh, so the communication mostly becomes around uh, rather than understanding their needs, their values, their how your product fits into their uh, day-to-day life. Uh, the marketers or the post-purchase communication often more focused on, uh, hey, here is the 10% discount for a second purchase. How do you think, uh, this, what should be the balance between the post-purchase communication promotions and the other aspect of post-purchase communication? How do you define a right strategy for a post-purchase communication so that it really helps you increase your CLV, not just yeah have the discount heavy customers coming back? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Giri, and uh, and I think the answer uh, relies into when the onboarding of a customer happened. So many marketers, as you've said, they think that if someone bought a product, they are ready to buy it again in two weeks or in one week. And that's why they push with this type of discount campaigns and whatever. But there are two things: the usage and the consumption cycle right so when i've extracted value from the product and i consumed the product i'm ready to buy it again if i haven't used the product then i'm not ready to buy again i mean why would i buy another product when i haven't used the first product if i haven't consumed the right product so the the worry of the marketers should not be around making them to buy again but making sure that if from 100% of your customers, 100% extracted the value from the first product. And when they extracted the value, and those things can be seen by looking at the data patterns, right? So you look at the purchase cycles, you need, you look at what is the frequency, right? So let's say you are selling hand creams. After how many days, for what kind of uh, 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 size, weight of the cream, Customers are buying again. And you can see that, I don't know, for 200 milliliters creams, uh, there is a purchase every three weeks, let's say. So when you see that, your your onboarding would be around how to use the cream, the effects of the vitamins within the cream, the fact that X, Y, Z. So basically the onboarding, it's going to be finished when you are making sure that the customers have extracted the value. And I, I talk a lot about this in, in my book as well. So when that customer is onboarded, then you can push another, uh, uh, another cell. Before that, you are just ruining your relationship with that customer because we need to nurture relationships. We have, I don't know, thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of relationships with all our customers. So we need to make sure that we don't sound like broken records. Buy again, buy again, buy again. Nobody wants to be to, to buy things, but everyone wants to make progress. If you're not sure that your customers have made progress, don't push another product at them. True. So there are a lot of examples in your life as consumers when companies just screwed up uh, the post-purchase communication and it just made you pissed off rather than going for the second purchase. Now, as everyone's favorite topic, uh, which is the AI and machine learning, and I'm sure uh, you as at Omni Convert really working or thinking in that direction, how these both elements, AI and machine learning, how to analyzing or churning the data at a huge scale uh, is going to define the CLV. Uh, what impact do you see right now and how do you see this industry progressing, let's say, in three years, five-year time span? Yeah, so what I, uh, what I can say with a grain of salt because I don't have like a crystal ball is that the predicting the, the, the future is uh, 
uh, is, is hard. So we don't know how, how fast the pace of uh, innovation is going to happen. What we do know is that, for instance, in our case, we work with, uh, at the module for, uh, it's called Omniconvert Pulse, which is, a, which is a product which gets customer feedback. And then it's understanding through natural language processing, it's clustering the feedback so that you can see in real time what are the main issues that the customers are, uh, are, are saying about your products, your services, and so on. And that's, that's a ma <laughs> major win for the uh, cost companies, which have many, uh, many customers saying a lot of things. So it's, it's like distinguishing the signal from the noise. And that's one way that we are leveraging the AI and is going to be used more and more, you know, because if you have thousands of customers uh, using uh, feedback forms and uh, stating things about what you do wrong and you don't do anything about it, then uh, how you prioritize, I mean, on what you should be focusing. Another thing is the um, purchase behavior. So right now we are also using this type of clustering methods to, for for. Uh, customers so that we push the second sale, you know, the prompt for the second, uh, for the next purchase according to what's, what has the highest probability to be sold. So basically it's more, uh, more in the sense of crafting right now, it's being, the, the AI is used more for understanding customer feedback, for analyzing the data, the, the behavior, the customer patterns and whatever. And it's going to be used, I think, in the next uh, period full throttle, you know, like it's going to be handling the messaging, the, crea the creative is going to be handling the personalization one-on-one. -on -one. Because if you are buying this type of product, let's say you're for a grocery retailer, you buy, let's say, 80 SKUs throughout your entire lifespan. And the pace that you are buying, uh, I don't know, uh, tomatoes is completely different than you, when, when you are buying, uh, I don't know, liquid soap or stuff like that. Then there are some ways that these algorithms will understand when you need certain things faster than you know. I mean, basically uh, building your, your basket in real time and uh, prompting you, are you out of eggs, X and Y and Z? Push this button and we'll send, it, uh, send them your way. So for that, that's going to, to, to surely happen because what is happening right now is like, Every time you go out there, you select again the same things, but you buy the same brands of, uh, I don't know, cheese or whatever. So that's one thing that I see uh, happening in the future as well. Great. So I think we had a, a fun, uh, fantastic conversation so far. I would like to end our conversation with a very simple uh, question. And that is because I'm also running a startup and I want to understand this really well from people like you. How do a startup with very limited resources, no cash flow, uh, like some amount of cash flow to at least survive in the market, can really uh, focus on improving the communication and increase your customer lifetime value? What What are your practical tips for them, people like those? Yeah, so I would uh, I would definitely start with uh, getting customer feedback. So that's the first thing, you know. Many companies think that they have a business model which is working, but what they have is a prototype. So unless you close the loop with customers and you, you find out out of 100 customers, how many of them are willing to recommend you again. And after investigating that, once you know that, you, un you also understand what stopped them from buying again and fixing that, then what you are doing is to subsidize the growth of uh, Google AdWords, uh, Meta Ads, Instagram, whatever. So that's the, that's the first thing. You need to make sure that you've closed the loop by getting constant feedback from your customers and prioritizing what matters to them. Because at the end of the day is, if I want to be more happy, I need to make the others around me happy. If I want to be more wealthy, I need to help the others be wealthy. I mean, it's always an indirect uh, uh, approach towards my objective. So that's the first thing, which is pretty easy. I mean, it's not that hard to run some surveys or to pick up the phone and to call your customers and to understand what makes them uh, uh, buy again, right? And the second thing is to 
shift towards this uh, customer-centric communication. So uh, email flows, like this type of uh, automated ways to, to, to communicate with them are, are also important. Be- because once you do this qualitative research through feedback, you improve the onboarding, you will get into the space of quantitative research. So you, there, are, there are a lot of tools. For instance, in our case, we we offer the tools uh, the 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 usage for smaller companies is uh, is free for our product called omniconvert reveal so and i'm sure i'm we are not the only ones right so there are pl- uh, uh, plenty of tools out there but the 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 <coughs> sorry the the underlining um, factor is that you need to educate yourself like if you're an entrepreneur you are at the beginning I mean, congrats for listening to this podcast, for instance. That means you're on the right path because you educate yourself. So in order to change things, you need to find out what things to change first because, of course, your resources are limited. But I'm pretty sure that if you don't stop, you know, if you continuously iterate and experiment, you will find the way. And it's uh, it, 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 it's having the right balance of uh, being... Uh, skeptical about what you already do because if you're not if you think that you've made an amazing job and you 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 disregard the critical thinking to change your ways then you are doomed true so true and uh, it it's really fantastic having you here and we had a great conversation valentin thank you thank you so much for joining us today and thank you guys for listening us so far if you have been uh, listening to us till here you have been a fantastic listener thanks for uh, doing that and make sure you subscribe to our podcast on uh, wherever you're listening from spotify youtube or apple podcast thank you valentin thank you once again and it's really great having you look forward to having you again thank you thank you giri and thanks everyone for listening